Hello everyone, this is Anya. This is part three of the studies on Jubilees that I am doing with the HOD group. And that is Jackson Snyder's group. And so this particular teaching, this third study, I thought went a good amount better than the, the second, the second seer session. Uh, basically, I thought the second one, I didn't do as good a job. I felt like I was more kind of uh, not prepared enough to sound good in my flow. Overall, I think the second one went well, but it was not nearly as good as most of the other sessions of studies on Jubilee that I have. I have been doing in this series. So this third one is much much better in my opinion than the last one and it goes all the way to basically we cover up to the time of the flood in the Jubilees account. So with that said, um, I mean I think it goes up to the uh, actually to the the new covenant or not the new covenant the covenant uh, established with Noah. That's wh where we end in this video. And so we basically cover the events of the of the pre-flood world and the the purification and atonement and the establishment of the Noah Noah covenant. So this uh, this one's definitely a good one to watch. With that said, I'm going to go now through the Patreon introduction. If you if you are not interested in listening to this beginning part, you may feel free to skip to the part where the study actually begins. But so right now I have one Patreon supporter and he's donating $25 a month and that's greatly appreciated. I definitely feel blessed to receive that amount from from someone from their free it's like a free, it's a free will offering from their from their heart so that's greatly appreciated now the my patreon uh, website let me give you the link for that let's see I'm trying to see where where's the uh, hold on one sec um, okay, so it's patreon.com slash Dead Sea Scrolls Religion. So slash D, so it's patreon.com slash D E A D S E A S C R O L L S R E L I G I O N. Patreon.com slash Dead Sea Scrolls Religion. And so for basic supporter, if you donate one dollar a month, your name will be mentioned in my, my videos that I make, as well as future publications of books of the Bible. <clears throat> a small supporter would be ten dollars a month, and that would be if you do ten dollars a month, you get one Google Hangout conference with me each month. If you want two Google Hangouts with me, you can do twenty-five dollars a month. Four Google Hangouts with me would be fifty dollars a month. One hundred dollars a month would be uh, if you want me to actually visit you um, once a year in person. I will do that for a hundred dollars a month. For visiting you twice in a year, that's two hundred and fifty dollars a month. Visiting three times a year is five hundred dollars a month, and visiting four times a year is one thousand dollars a month. And if you want to donate, you can without getting the reward. Like if you prefer not to have the reward, like if you don't want me to visit you, but you do want to support, uh, if you do want to donate that amount, then you can request that you don't want the reward. Same thing with the Google Hangouts conference. If you're not interested in that, but you still want to donate that much, you certainly can. And you can also donate different amounts. You don't have to donate those 
specific amounts, like one, I mean, you know, the first one is a dollar, the next one is ten dollars. What about if someone wants to donate anywhere between two dollars and nine dollars? Well, you definitely can. There's an option on Patreon that you can do that. Some people might want to donate five dollars, for example, that's fine. So yeah, uh, whatever you feel free to donate, whatever you want to donate, feel free to do so, and with that said, I hope you enjoy this next video in the series I am doing on the Book of Jubilees. Shalom everybody, this is Yochanan. I am uh, here with Onya Carlson for the 333 Club. He's going to be teaching about uh, Jubilees, doing an overview and answering any questions that anybody might have. So, um, if you don't mind, uh, Anya, if you could give a kind of a brief overview of where you've been so we can um, kind of catch up or at least have an idea of where you've gone before. So, yeah, sure. Anya, how are yours? Um, well, first, I just want to say for those who are here, we've only got a few people on, but uh, if, uh, if you have any questions, you could, you could type out your questions or you can also... You can also turn your mic on and, and speak up and ask the question. Uh, try to try to wait until I'm not talking or to ask a question, um, like to actually speak up. But at any time you can, if you want to ask a question and I'm in the middle of something, you can always type it up and uh, I'll see that. Um, but yeah, so basically we are in our third series uh, on the Book of Jubilees. Jackson really wanted me to dive in for the Ahad into the Book of Jubilees to kind of give my own perspective on it since he knows I consider it scripture and I hold it in very high esteem. And it's one of the more significant books in that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So that's something that's important for the Ahad to consider to see if it's a way to help us, uh, if it helps us find the faith better and go back to the roots, so to speak. But so what we discussed uh, in the previous one was, well, in the first teaching, we I did an overview of the entire concept of the Book of Jubilees and an overview of roughly the significance and importance that the Book of Jubilees has. Now, in the second video teaching that we did, I did like very specific topics. And I started going from the beginning and kind of talked about what the main premise or purpose that the Book of Jubilees was written. I talked about how Jubilees presents itself as a version of the law given to Moses by angels and how that connects with the New Testament because there's a few places in the New Testament which suggest that the, the law was given to angels. That's a direct connection with Jubilees. I also talked about the Link some of the links that it has that Jubilee specifically has with documents of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like, there's a special psalm in the Psalm Scroll that corresponds strikingly with what Jubilee says in chapter two. So, I talked about some things like that and and some of the textual criticism issues about the whole. Masoretic versus Septuagint and Samaritan, those kind of things. I mentioned how the, the origin of the Sabbath and how it was set apart specifically for Israel as a holy nation. And um, let's see, also talked about like the Garden of Eden and the significance of how Jubilees tells us certain things about the Garden of Eden that Genesis doesn't like. How the uh, how every tree was holy in the garden, including the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was a holy tree. It wasn't a bad tree. It was actually a holy tree. So that kind of helps give us some more insight on the whole story. The other thing is that according to Jubilees, uncleanness ex existed prior to the fall of Adam. Um, and that implies that death existed before the fall. Let's see what else did we have here? that we discussed last time and that animals used to talk before 
and that there's a very similar uh, there's a similar event that happens in Jubilees. It like presents it presents the Adam being kicked out of the garden with animals being dispersed. It presents that as a parallel to the Tower of Babel incident because just like in the Tower of Babel where you have everyone in one place, you have all the people together, then Elohim messes up their languages and can go to the places that they are assigned. In the same exact way, you have all the humans and animals in one place in the Garden of Eden and then and then uh, Elohim, the language of the animals, he makes it so that animals cannot talk anymore. And he disperses animals and humans away into their assigned places. So it's a very parallel comparison to the Tower of Babel incident. So that's something we alluded to, we briefly touched on in the last teaching. And also we talked about how there's the command in Jubilees to act, that we are supposed to be wearing clothes. Animal, uh, animals don't have to wear clothes, but humans do. And that's actually stated as a law in, in Genesis. There's no law. In the Bible, there's no law in the Old Testament that you have to wear clothes. But in Jubilees, there is. So that's an interesting extra detail Jubilees has that the Bible doesn't. And not only that, but it also says for the Gentiles who don't know the law, they're not condemned for breaking that law. The basic idea is that we're only accountable for how much we're aware of, how much we have ability to know of. So for those who do not have access to the Bible, they're judged on a completely different level than we are. So that's something that Jubilees revealed to us as well that we discussed last time. So we're going we're gonna to continue uh, this video now uh, I mean, the series, we're going to continue where we left off. But before we do that, I was talking with Yokanan uh, before we started, but I wanted to get it on the recording. He had a question or two. Do you still have that question you wanted to ask? Yeah, sure. Um, I was asking if there were any precursors to Jubilees, like um, you mentioned that it's in the Psalm scroll. There is evidence of uh, that it corresponds to a psalm in the Psalm scroll the events in chapter two. So are there any more things like that? Like, I guess if you were to look in, um, I guess, older either archaeology or writings are uh, the scroll or, I'm sorry, Jubilees uh, spoken of or hinted at in any way. There are a lot of allusions in ancient writings to things that elsewhere we only see in Jubilees. Um, and in terms of actually proving uh, undoubtedly that Jubilees is of ancient origin, that's very difficult to do to, con to convince the skeptics, you know, because if you require absolute proof, that can be very difficult to satisfy. Um, you know, with the oldest copies of any book of the Bible, be it Apocrypha or regular books, the oldest copies we have are the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they only predate the time of the Messiah by about no more than 200 years. So from, from the third century BC to the first century AD, that's when the Dead Sea Scrolls are from, and that's our oldest copies of the Bible. So that's a far cry from when these books claim to be written. You know, Enoch claims to be written before the flood. We don't have any manuscripts anywhere close to when the Book of Enoch was actually claiming to be written. We only have fragmentary copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But with Enoch, for example, that has a lot of evidence that corresponds it. Like all these other books are pointing to it as an authority. Jubilees, on the other hand, it has some books are pointing to it as an authority, but not as pointing it that Enoch has. So we know it's an ancient writing because of Jubilee, uh, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, one thing that helps to confirm its authority and ancient origin is also how it corresponds with another document called the Genesis Apocryphon. And the Genesis Apocryphon, I believe there's some good evidence that that is far older than Genesis and is our very archaic and primitive. 
and no matter what, I think it can be I think it can be proven without a shadow of a doubt that Genesis Apocryphon is older than Jubilees because there are a lot of things in Jubilees that are clearly derived from Genesis Apocryphon. In other words, it's very clear that whoever wrote Jubilees, be it the authentic angel or Moses who wrote it or people way later, in either case, they definitely were using Genesis Apocryphon as a source. There's so many allusions and quotes and references to the Genesis Apocrypha all throughout Jubilees. Uh, but another thing that kind of goes in Jubilees' favor is the Temple Scroll. As I've talked in other teachings, the, the Temple Scroll is a very ancient version of the law, and I've provided evidence in other teachings that I've done that Temple Scroll is the original version of Deuteronomy. Now, if that is the case, then if Jubilees is con confirming and corroborating an account in the Temple Scroll, that must mean Jubilees is also very ancient because it's preserving an ancient record. It's a link with this very ancient copy of the Torah that Jubilees has. We also see in Jubilees a version of Torah in line with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see copies of the Torah that are similar to the Septuagint Samaritan and partially corresponds with sometimes the Masoretic. So we have this like mixed bag, it seems almost. And it also has unique readings that are not attested anywhere else in Dead Sea Scroll copies of, of the Torah. Jubilees, you see when you compare parallel passages of Jubilees with the Torah, it, many passages correspond with the Septuagint, sometimes with the Samaritan, and on a, occasionally it corresponds with the Masoretic, and sometimes it has completely unique readings not supported by any other uh, testimony. So that type of mixed bag is a similar thing you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it, Jubilees and Dead Sea Scrolls, very strong connection, and it, it shows how ancient the Book of Jubilees really is. Those are just I, kind of some of the things that I can think of to kind of help illustrate that for your question. Another thing which I'm going to get into is there's a fragment that was found in the Dead Sea Schools of an earlier version of Jubilees, which appears to be like another book of Jubilees entirely. It's completely different than our book of Jubilees, but like a, a earlier version far prior. So if that's the case, this means that there... Jubilees must be a really old writing if there's a writing prior to it as well. Uh, maybe I should... Maybe, I don't know if maybe I should go to that now or maybe I'll wait until a little bit. Well, you can't Do you have any follow-up questions? Um, no, I think you've done a, a pretty fair job. As you said, uh, you know, you laid out the evidence and you said that, you know, uh, which is true that the Bible books we can't find really ancient copies like from 900 bc we don't, no one has anything like that exactly so you know uh the, the dead sea scrolls push our um understanding of the scriptures back well at least according uh if you're looking at the masoretic text what the most people most people have access to a thousand years so that's quite a bit yep so yeah now you can, let me go ahead I'm going to tell you guys, I didn't mention this last time, but I would like to mention it this time. It's an interesting detail, uh, just of textual criticism purposes. So, you know, in Genesis, it says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Uh, let me just quickly check the Hebrew of that passage because I have something really interesting to share with you guys about about that passage, but I want to make sure the, that I have the Hebrew of it correct. But no matter what the Hebrew is, the point remains the same. So I'm, I just want to make sure, though. Okay. So, she shall be called woman, or Isha, because she was taken out of Ish. 
the, that's the word in Hebrew. The Hebrew word is used for woman, it's Isha, and the word for man in this verse of Genesis is Ish. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, what's really interesting is in the Septuagint and the Samaritan and the Old Latin, it says instead, it says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Ish or woman because she was taken out of her Ish or her man. It has an extra letter there, which has the meaning of her. And that you see that in the Septuagint, you see that in the Samaritan, the Old Latin, and you see that in the Book of Jubilees. So here we have an example where Jubilees agrees with all the other witnesses against the Masoretic text. And yet scholars still cling to the Masoretic text as better. When you have all the other witnesses saying something else, it makes for a strong case that that reading of the Masoretic is not correct and that the all the other witnesses are correct because these are not these other witnesses are not from the same source they're very diverse sources yet they're all saying the same thing so that's just one of the many examples of how Jubilees helps us gives us more insight into the textual criticism of the book of Genesis so with that said let me move on here now see. Another thing that's interesting is Jubilees actually gives us a lot of uh, timeline that Genesis does it. Like one of the things it tells us is that Cain was born 70 years after the first day. Abel was born 77 years after and Awan, their sister, was born 84 years after the first day. So these are some chronological details that we don't get in Genesis but that we do see it helps us give a picture, a better understanding of how the story happened. There's a verse, I gotta open Jubilees for you guys. Let's see here. There's a verse in Jubilees that I'm gonna read, which I think is important. It's specifically about if a man murders someone else. I believe that's when Cain, Cain, uh, whoops, what, hold on, wrong book, I opened Enoch for a sec, my bad, okay, so we've got here, this is what it says, after Cain's killed Abel, it says, And on this account it is written on the heavenly tables, Cursed is he who smites his neighbor treacherously. And let all who have seen and heard say, So be it. And the man who has seen and not declared, let him be accursed as the other. So this tells us something significant. It tells us that, first of all, if you murder someone, you're cursed. We do know that from the Bible. But the additional detail that we're told is that if you see someone murder someone else, but you don't say anything, you, you keep quiet about it because you're scared, you are also cursed and you're considered just like a murderer because you're hiding a murder. And if you hide a murder, you're considered partially complicit in the murder. So that's a, an important detail that we don't get in the regular Bible that helps us understand that we are just as culpable if we hide murder. Not just just because we didn't do the murder doesn't mean we're not guilty. So we have Jubilees helps us know that we have an obligation. If we see something do if we see a crime happening that's that has that's a serious crime, we have a duty for justice to reveal the truth to the world and to report this crime that happened and to make sure that justice is had. Because we know in the Torah that if if the person who was murdered is not avenged, the, the, the land is defiled and cursed by the blood. That's what we see that in the Torah. So. Now, also we see it right after Jubilee says, 
right after this account, it says, For this reason, we announce when we come before the Lord our God, all the sin which is committed in heaven and on earth, and in light and in darkness and everywhere. What that means is because, because if someone uh, kills someone else, they are to be cursed. And if someone sees it and doesn't say anything, they're cursed as well. Because of that, the angels have to always be watching. They have to be watching to see what are people doing. And in other books of scripture, we, we do see that there are, are, I, there are uh, angels known as guardian angels. There's angels all over the place. Uh, there's the spirits of, of weather. There's the spirits of various emotions. You know, the spirit of anger, the spirit of sadness, things like that. These are actual spirits that are with people. And they can report what has happened, what they see. They're, so the angels, there are angels everywhere that we don't see. And these angels, when they see whatever's being done, they, would make, they make reports of it and bring the reports up to Elohim. We see in books like Third Baruch, one of the books of scripture is called Third Baruch, and we see in that book angels actually bring baskets or something an analogous to baskets. They bring up containers of uh, they bring up containers of people's prayers and bring the prayers up so that Elohim can can receive the prayers and answer people's prayers. We know in the, in the scriptures, not all prayers are even brought up to Elohim and heard. Many times, Elohim ignores people's prayers because of their sin in their life. So, but the prayers that are not ignored, they are brought up and received by Elohim, and he chooses which ones to answer. And then uh, Yochanan says, very few angels are mentioned by name in Torah as we have it. Uh, compared to the scrolls, yeah, you like uh, we we see angel names in many other writings like Enoch, um, and in other books of scripture we do see names of angels, but we don't see that too much in the regular Bible. That's an interesting point to mention. Now. This is another detail which I alluded to last time. But basically, you know the question that people say is, wait a minute, when Cain, when Cain, Cain fled, whoops, uh, hold on. Okay, so when, when Cain uh, fled, because he had killed Abel and then received a mark, he ran away. When it says when he ran away, first of all, he was afraid that people would kill him, and then it says he took his wife with him and he had kids. And, they, and the question that people have is, where did Cain get his wife and who was he afraid of? Well, a lot of people assume that, okay, well, there must have been other people because Cain would not have married his own sister, right? Well, actually, according to the Jubilees, Cain did marry his own sister. And it makes sense because, as I mentioned, I think I alluded to this in the last teaching, but... Uh, at some point, there was only two humans. There was a previous time where no other humans existed, and the first humans had to be there had to be two humans. So, if there was two humans in the beginning, they had would have had kids, and their kids had to have interbred because they would have been the only humans. So, it's not the Torah does not present brother and sister matching as bad as father daughter, mother, son pairings. Those are, those are universally condemned in scripture as horrific, disgusting, abominum, abominable incest. Whereas a sister and brother, an aunt and nephew, uncle and niece, they're not presented in the same light as, an, as much negativity as a father, mother, and child are. And that's because originally it wasn't always wrong for a brother and sister to, to have kids together. And the same thing for an aunt and uncle and their nephew or niece. Because it, why, why, we have to think, 
the scriptures force us to think about some of these things. Why are those, why is that wrong? And when we think about it, it makes sense why it became wrong eventually because of the DNA thing. The, 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 um, the DNA is too close between siblings. It's too close. If, if siblings have kids together, their kids will be all mutated and deformed or have birth defects. So that's wrong. It's wrong to have kids if your kids are going to have birth defects. But in the, in the very beginning, what was it like in the very beginning? People lived to 900 years old. It's clear that they didn't have the same birth defects at that time as we do today. After the flood, then health started deteriorating rapidly. It was at that time when some of these laws started coming into place where, okay, now siblings should not be together because the DNA is too weak now. And it's the same thing with... Um, with the whole, uh, with the, the aunt and uncle thing. Uh, and we, so we see in the Torah, Abraham marries his own sister, his half sister, Sarah, and that's not condemned at all in Genesis. We see that Moses, own dad marries his aunt. So to clarify, Moses's dad, Amram, Amram marries Amram's aunt. Jacobet, and Jacobet is the daughter of Levi. So, and the Torah does not condemn them either. So we see that prior to Moses, these matchings were not considered incest. They were considered acceptable matching. And Jubilees helps confirm that, that understanding that Cain married his sister. And what, what else do we see in Jubilees? We see that not only did Cain marry his sister, Seth married his sister. And not only that, Seth, uh, excuse me, I just said Seth, but Enosh, who is Seth's son, married his sister, and Enosh's son, Kenan, also married his sister. Now, Kenan's son, Mahalalel, they married their cousins, their first cousins, and from then on, every, every uh, next in line of Mahalalel would marry their cousins. So Enoch married his cousin. Um, well, there was one before, Jared. Uh, Jared married his cousin. And so then Enoch married his cousin, Methuselah, his cousin, Lamech, his cousin, and Noah, his cousin. So they all married their cousins. Now, Noah had three sons, and uh, his sons all got married. Seth's sons married the, uh, their sisters, according to the Genesis Apocrypha. And this is praised in the Genesis of Parliament. This is praised as a pure and good thing. Whereas Japheth and, and Ham, their sons married each other's daughters. So basically, Japheth's sons married their first cousins, their cousins from Ham's side. And Ham's sons married uh, the first cousins from Japheth's side. All I have to say, these documents show us a different picture about what incest is. According to scripture, incest was far less than what it is today. It has only become so broad today because of how harmful it is for the DNA. So anyway, all I have to say, I'm not endorsing incest, but I'm explaining how in scripture, there was a time where certain relationships were not considered incest, but the father and daughter and mother and, and son was always considered incest from the very beginning. It always was. There's never an instance in scripture that's endorsed at all. Okay, so next I'm going to go to... This is an interesting thing. I'm going to read this. This is from Jubilees. This tells us why, why was Jared given the name Jared? We're going to see why he was, and what we see is very insightful. It says, he called his name Jared, for in his days the angels of the Lord descended on the earth, those who are named the watchers, that they should instruct the children of men, and that they should do judgment and uprightness on the earth. So what's really cool is that in, in a traditional understanding from like Enoch, for example, tells us that the watchers came down, and that was a bad thing. The watchers sinned because they came down. They should not have come down. 
So they, came, they, they descended to the earth in sin, with sinful intent. And that's why uh, it, what happened happened, because they came down with the intention to mix with women. Well, some other writings tell us a different story. Jubilees, Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, has a similar story. And the Nazarene Acts that we've talked about in the Yahad has the same story. The story that these three documents have is that the watchers came down in righteousness because they wanted to teach chill, uh, they wanted to teach humans to stop sinning. Humans were being so sinful that they actually came down to teach them what righteousness is. When they came down, they started teaching them righteousness, but then over time, they got seduced by the daughters of men. And when they got seduced, they wanted to have kids. And they, one thing led to another, and they sinned, and, and they fell from, from their glory. So this presents a very different picture, but this is an amazing, unique story that Jubilees has that only a few other sources have. So all these sources have the same story. It's lining up and showing, wow, this is actually strong evidence for this story. So Jubilees' story is strongly supported by other documents that we hold as sacred, especially the Nazarene Acts. With that said, I'm going to actually read the section on, on from the Nazarene Acts because I find it so amazing. Very few people have heard of this passage because um, it's so obscure. Most people don't know about the book. Not only that, Jackson Snyder, his version of the Nazarene Acts only comes primarily from the recognitions. It doesn't have all the readings from what's called the homilies. There's a, a version of the Nazarene Acts called the homilies of Clement. And it has many other uh, passages that the recognition of Clement does not. And some of these extra passages that homilies has are more controversial and have some teachings that the recognitions does not. So with that said, I'm going to read from the homilies version, because that's the version that has this striking similarity with what Jubilee says about the angels coming down to teach them righteousness. So I don't know if you guys have heard this, but it's a pretty powerful passage. I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. It's a slight tangent, but it's a really cool one, and it helps give some more background to what Jubilee is talking about, the story. And I'm very convinced that uh, Genesis Apocryphon was not fully preserved, but Parts of it were, and the rest of it is kind of alluded to in Jubilees. So we can kind of have a rough idea of what the rest of Genesis Apocryphon actually said. So I am of the belief that the, the story that I'm about to read from the homilies of Clement is actually derived from the Genesis Apocryphon, the lost portion of the Genesis Apocryphon. All I have to say here is the passage. Okay, but they, because they had, at, they had at first no experience of evils, being insensible to the gift of good things, were turned to ingratitude by abundance of food and luxuries. He's talking about humans right here. So that they even thought that there was no providence, since they had not by previous labor got good things as the reward of righteousness, inasmuch as no one of them had fallen into any suffering or disease or any other necessity. So that as is usual for men afflicted on account of wicked transgression, they should look about for the God who was able to heal them. But immediately after their despite, which proceeded from fearlessness and secure luxury, a certain just punishment met them as following from a certain arranged harmony, removing from them good things as having hurt them, and introducing evil things instead as advantageous. For of the spirits who inhabit the heaven, the angels who dwell in the lowest region, being grieved at the ingratitude of men of, to God, asked that they might come into the life of men, that, really becoming men, by more intercourse, they might convict those who had acted ungratefully towards him, and might subject everyone to adequate punishment. When, therefore, their petition was granted, they metamorphosed themselves into every nature, for being of a more godlike substance, they are able easily to assume any form. So they became precious stones and goodly pearl, 
and the most beauteous purple and choice gold in all matter that is held in most esteem. And they fell into the hands of some and into the bosoms of others and suffered themselves to be stolen by them. They also changed themselves into beasts and reptiles and fishes and birds and into whatsoever they pleased. These things also the poets among yourselves by reason of fearlessness sing as they befell, attributing to one the many and the verse doings of all. But when, having assumed these forms, they convicted as covetous those who stole them and changed themselves into the nature of men, in order that, living holily and showing the possibility of so living, they might subject the ungrateful to punishment, yet having become in all respects men, they also partook of human lust, and being brought under its subjection, they fell into cohabitation with women, and being involved with them, and sunk in defilement, and altogether emptied of their first power, they were unable to turn back to the first purity of their proper nature. Their members turned away from their fiery substance, for their fire itself, being extinguished by the weight of lust, and changed into flesh, they trod the impious path downward. For they themselves, being fettered with the bonds of flesh, were constrained and strongly bound. Wherefore they have no more been able to ascend into the heavens. For after the intercourse, being asked to show what they were before, and being no longer able to do so, on account of their being unable to do anything else after their defilement, yet wishing to please their mistresses, instead of themselves, they showed the bowels of the earth. I mean the choice metals, gold, brass, silver, iron, and the like, with all the most precious stones. And along with these charmed stones, they delivered the art of the things pertaining to each and imparted the discovery of magic, and taught astronomy, and the powers of roots, and whatever was impossible to be found out by the human mind. Also the melting of gold, and silver, and the like, and the various dyings of garments, and all things in short which are for the adornment and delight of women, are the discoveries of these demons bound in flesh. But from their unhallowed intercourse spurious men sprang, much greater in stature than ordinary men, whom they afterwards called giants. They were wild in manners and greater than men in size, inasmuch as they sprung, they were sprung of angels, yet less than angels because they were born of women. Therefore God, knowing that they were barbarized to brutality and that the world was not sufficient to satisfy them, for it was created according to the proportion of men in human use, they might not turn, they might not through want of food turn contrary to nature to the eating of animals and yet seem to be blameless as having ventured upon this through necessity. The Almighty God reigned made out upon them, suited to their various tastes, and they enjoyed all that they would. But they, on account of their bastard nature, not being pleased with purity of food, longed only after the taste of blood, wherefore they tasted after flesh. So it keeps going a little bit. But anyway, so that's the unique story that's, that's very similar to Jubilees. That extra story of how the Watchers came down for righteousness, to teach men how to be righteous and to stop sinning, but they fell away into sin. I read a little bit more of that because I thought it was so cool how it gives extra details that are found nowhere else in our copies of scripture. With all that said, now, what's really cool is Jubilees talks about the book of Enoch. Jubilees endorses Enoch as scripture. There's a lot of passages where it tells us that Enoch wrote things. So let's see what we've got here. Oh, yeah, where was it written in the homilies? Uh, that is homily 8. That's homily 8. So, let's see here. So, according, it says, in the fourth jubilee, Enoch was born. No, excuse me. In the fourth year of the jubilee the 11th jubilee so it says enoch he was the first among men that are born on earth who learned writing and knowledge and wisdom and who wrote down the signs of heaven according to the order of their months in a book did someone have a question oh, no, okay. um so uh he wrote them the order of the months in a book that men might know the seasons of the years according to the order of their separate months so what does that tell us that's a that's a correspondence to what the book of Enoch is, because there's a section in the book of Enoch which Enoch writes in detail the calendar. He writes the order of the months and the signs of the heaven. 
And we're told that Enoch was the first one who learned writing. So where did writing come from? Enoch was the first one who, who learned it, and he learned it from the watchers. So then it also says Enoch, he was the first to write a testimony, and he testified to the sons of men among generations of the earth, and recounted the weeks of the jubilees, and made known to them the days of the years, and set in order the months, and recounted the Sabbaths of the years, as we made known to him. So something to let you guys know is that, first of all, we got the book of Enoch. Then we've got another book of Enoch in the Dead Sea Scrolls um, that was given for Lamech. It's concluded in the Genesis Apocrypha. Then we have another book, which was given to the giants that we see in the Book of Giants. And we also have another book of Enoch, which is called Second Enoch. And I believe that is valid, but that it is corrupt in many places. But in Second Enoch, we see Enoch is revealed a lot of things, including Enoch is told about the Sabbath. He's told about how there was a Sabbath. And he's told about um, the order of the years. So it appears that Enoch did, in fact, learn about the Jubilees as well at this time. But in our copies of the Book of Enoch, we don't see that. We don't see mention of Jubilees. But we do have other lost writings of Enoch that are only partially preserved, like the one in the Book of Lamech and the Book of Giants, only partially preserved. So it's very sure that in one of those other writings, Enoch did, in fact, learn and receive knowledge about the, the, the Sabbath years and the Jubilees. Then it says in, in Jubilees, it tells us Enoch also what was and what will be, he saw in a vision of his sleep, as it will happen to the children of men throughout their generations until the day of judgment. He saw and understood everything and wrote his testimony and placed the testimony on earth for all the children of men and for the generations. So that's um, impressive because it also connects with Enoch, the book of Enoch, where Enoch sees a dream vision in his sleep. He sees a dream about animals, and that's exactly what that's exactly what uh, uh, one sec. That's exactly what uh, Jubilee says Enoch saw and wrote down this dream vision from the book of Enoch. Then we're told that Enoch took to himself a wife, and her name was Edna. Well, lo and behold, in the book of Enoch, Enoch says that his wife's name is Edna. So there's only two books that say Enoch's wife's name, and that's Jubilees and uh, Book of Enoch. And they both agree that the, that the wife of Enoch's name was Edna. That cannot be coincidence. That's a clear connection. And Jubilees claims to be derived from Enoch, so we know Enoch is older than Jubilees. So that's a powerful testimony to the ancient origin and authority of Enoch, the book of Enoch. Then it says, after he had a son, Methuselah, it says, Enoch, he was moreover with the angels of God, the six Jubilees of years, and they showed him everything which was on the earth and in the heavens, the rule of the sun, and he wrote down everything. And he testified to the watchers, who had sinned with the daughters of men, for these had begun to unite themselves so as to be defiled with the daughters of men. And Enoch testified against all. And he was taken from amongst the children of men, and we conducted him into the Garden of Eden in majesty and honor. And behold, there he writes down the condemnation and judgment of the world and all the wickedness of the children of men. So we're told that Enoch was put into the Garden of Eden, and he still writes there as a scribe of heaven, or a scribe of paradise. And second Enoch confirms this, that Enoch was chosen to write to write uh, down the condemnation of the world and the, the, the wickedness that men do. And let's see here. Um, And so how he testified to the watchers, that's found in the book of Enoch, and it's also found in the book of Giants. Now, with that said, I'm going to read to you guys a really cool passage from, a, it's a fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, so I'm going to read the passage from Jubilees one more time, and I'm going to also post it as a comment in the messages that you guys can read. 
is right here. Um, he was moreover with the angels of God these six jubilees of years, and they showed him everything which is on earth and in the heavens, the rule of the sun, and he wrote down everything. Okay? So that's what that says. Now watch this. This is what a fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls says. Let's see here. Let me just get, just got to load the Dead Sea Scroll PDF file. Um, hold on one sec. I got to just find this, but it's really a cool fragment. It shows that there's an earlier version of Jubilees. That's what I alluded to at the beginning of this teaching. My apologies for the delay. I thought the uh, PDF file was already loaded, but it's, but I had to reload it. Um, hold on, this is in my, I'm sorry. It's not moving for some reason. One sec, guys, this is really really good. I think it's, I think it's around 224 or Q224. Let me check that. I was trying to find and search in the, in the find bar, but it's not working right now. So I believe it's 224. Let me see what someone said. Yeah, I actually think, uh, I mentioned this on Facebook. I think it would be a really good idea to do a a teaching series on the on the Nazarene Acts, and not only that, I would like to make a version of the Nazarene Acts, where basically I take the recognitions and homilies and jumble them together to create the correct original reading as best as possible. Because they're two very ver very different versions, and they say sometimes they say very different things. So it's good. I think it'd be good to see, and I do believe a lot of people get off track from bad interpretation of what the Nazarene Acts says, so I would like to present what I believe is the correct interpretation of that book. But we will get to that, I just don't know exactly when we will do that, but it'll, I foresee that we will do that sometime this year, we will start that. So, okay, so, looks like it might be, 227. Yep, okay. It's fragment 227. Okay. And it says 4Q 227. And I'm gonna post it. Now when it says when it says dot dot dot, that means there's a unspecified amount of text missing in the fragment. If it's in brackets, that means they reconstructed it. So it wasn't actually found in the fragment, but they Based on the parallel in Jubilees, they filled in those missing sections. So here's what it says. Enoch, after we had taught him, that missing a few words, and then says six Jubilees of years, then says earth among the sons of men, and he gave witness against them all. Some more missing words, and then says, and also against the watchers, and he wrote everything. Some more missing words, and then heavens and the paths of their armies and perhaps the months, but I don't, I don't know. So, and then it says, so that the just would not stray. But look, there's a lot of parallels with what, with what the passage from Jubilee says. That's not a coincidence. That shows it's an earlier version of Jubilees. So it's either, it's either the book of Jubilees by a very different version, or as I believe, it's a second book of Jubilees, a completely different book of Jubilees, but that is earlier and that this new book of Jubilees is based on. And why do I believe that? Because I actually have seen evidence in the book of Jubilees that there is another Jubilees book. And that evidence is that just like Moses, you know, Moses was given a review of all history. Uh, the angels revealed to him 
in the book of Jubilees, it's angels t going through all of history and explaining what happened from creation until his time. The same thing happens with Abraham in the book of Jubilees. I'll read the passage. Here's what it, we're told for Abraham. It says, And the Lord God said, Open his mouth and his ears, that he may hear and speak with his mouth with the language which has been revealed. For it had, it had ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the day of the overthrow. And I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips, and I began to speak with him in Hebrew, in the tongue of creation. And he, referring to Abraham, he took the books of his fathers, and these were written in Hebrew, and he transcribed them. And he began from henceforth to study them. And I, the angels talking, and I made known to him that which he could not understand. And he studied them during the six rainy months. So what do we see here? The very angel that is explaining to Moses the history of the scriptures, the Genesis, Parkland, and Enoch, he's explaining the history of it to him. That same exact angel did the same exact thing with Abraham. He took Abraham, talked with him, helped him understand the scriptures of Enoch and and Noah. He explained to him all the events that happened so that Abraham would know what these books meant. So I believe that fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls is a fragment from this book of Jubilees that was given to Abraham. And then that would explain why there's very, there's a lot of differences between the fragment and Jubilees, but why they're so similar. So that would mean that that would mean that there was a very big book of Jubilees given to Abraham that covered the time from creation all the way till Abraham, uh, Abraham's early life. Then, uh, then there would be the time of Moses where the angel appeared to Moses and took all the other writings that came from before, so all the way from the beginning of time up until Moses, and also took that extra book of Jubilees and made a summary of the whole thing. So I think that's how the origin of Jubilees came about. Jubilees is a composite text derived from all these ancient earlier writings. So that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls show some significance there for helping us see some more into the origin of the Book of Jubilees. Now, let's see. The name of, of Lamech's wife in Jubilees is um, it is Betanos, which means daughter of man. Enosh means man. Bet is daughter, so Betanos is daughter of man, daughter of Enosh. And so so Jubilee says us that that's the, the name of his wife, and the only other book that says that is the Genesis Apocrypha, which has a copy of the Book of Lamech in it, and it tells us that Lamech's wife's name is Bethanos. So a striking correspondence there that shows that Jubilee is clearly connected with Genesis Apocrypha. Not only that, but Enoch is connected with Genesis Apocrypha because. That section of the book of, of for the book of Lamech of Genesis Parkfond strikingly corresponds to the very end of Book of Enoch. Because we, as we know from the Book of Enoch, the very end has a section on uh, the birth of Noah, and it's 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 a short little chapter, but it's a chapter or two about the birth of Noah and how Lamech was scared and thought that Noah was not his child, so he went to Enoch. Well, he went to Methuselah, and Methuselah went to Enoch to hear whether Noah was pure or not, and that Noah was Lamech's son or not. That same story is found in much greater detail in the Genesis Apocrypha. So we see a clear Enoch, Book of Enoch, if that's authentic, and we believe, as the Yahad, we believe that Book of Enoch is authentic. That account in Enoch is definitely derived from a longer version, and that longer version is found in the Genesis Apocrypha. So that means the Genesis Apocrypha is very ancient and comparable to authority to this book of, book of Enoch. And that means Book of Enoch and Genesis Apocrypha are prior to Jubilees. It just, all these connections help us see how ancient and authoritative these other 
apocryphal writings really are. And they all connect together. They're not like they're not like telling radically different stories and contradictory stuff. They're telling very similar things. Now there are some apocryphal books that contradict each other, but you don't see that too much in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You, you see the you see a very strong Enochian teaching. All the Dead Sea Scrolls endorsed. It's like very the, the teaching is very harmonious. So that's strong evidence that they're not just making things up, but it's a very unified message. Now, some of these later apocryphal books, they're very different and and corrupted by the scribes and sacred accounts have general general ideas that are very similar. So overall, we see the apocrypha is highly reliable on a similar level as the extra books. So we've been going an hour here. Let me see. Well, no, a little bit less than an hour. Um, I have a slightly more that I have prepared, and then we'll have to end it. But we could probably end with some questions, maybe. Um, so let's see. Jubilee says that there's four holy places on earth. I'm going to read that passage. All right, let's see. Um, for the Lord has four places on the earth, the Garden of Eden, and the Mount of the East, and this mountain on which thou art this day, Mount Sinai, and Mount Zion. So those are the four places, the Garden of Eden, which actually is on a mountain according to... Um, According to some apocryphal documents, Garden of Eden is on a mountain. So, okay, so Garden of Eden, Mount of the East, whatever that means, we don't know what Mount of the East is, Mount Sinai, and Mount Zion. Those are the four holy places on the earth. Now, I do, I believe, I could be wrong on this, but Mount of the East, I suspect that might be the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is a holy place in the New Testament Apocrypha. It's, it's one of the main places where all new revelations given to the apostles, all the secret revelations that mysteries that are revealed to the apostles it, so often it happens on the mount of olives so i suspect that that might be the mountain of the east so those are the four places and then it says that the garden of eden is actually the holiest place on earth let me see where that is um Hmm, hold on. Wait. Okay, it says, he knew that the garden, this is in chapter 8 of Jubilees, it says, he knew that the garden of garden is, excuse me, the garden of Eden is the holy of holies and the dwelling of the Lord. So, the garden of Eden is considered the holy of holies. That's how important it is. That's why you try to think, why did, uh, why did all this horrible stuff happen because they took a fruit from the Garden of Eden. It doesn't make sense, right? It does make sense when you realize how holy and sacred the Garden of Eden is. The Garden of Eden's holiness is comparable to the temple. You know how the Ark of the Covenant, the, the one guy touched the Ark and died because of it? Because the Ark is really holy. That's a similar level of holiness in the Garden of Eden. We are told that, according to Eve, and this is corroborated by Third, third Baruch, Eve was told that God, or excuse me, Elohim commanded not just to, not even to eat it, but also don't even touch the fruit. We don't see that command of the detail, do not touch it. So some people give Eve a hard time and say that Eve added to, God, to Elohim's command. But I don't agree with that. I think the original command was, do not even touch it. And that that command was simply removed by the scribes. That makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so, so what we see is that Okay, here's where it says, Jubilee chapter 3. It says, when she, talking about Eve, when she had completed these 80 days, we brought her into the Garden of Eden. For it is holier than all the earth besides, and every tree that is planted in it is holy. So you have this understanding that the Garden of Eden is a holy place. And I have a theory that I can't absolutely prove, but it makes a lot of sense about the Garden of Eden. Follow me here on this. First of all, have you guys heard of the Gaia hypothesis? 
Gaia means Earth in Greek. And the hypothesis, the Gaia hypothesis, suggests that the Earth is a living being. There's actually some good evidence for this. The scriptures, in some scriptures, it alludes to the Earth as, as if it's alive. And then there's also certain things that happen that seem like a living being trying to purify itself, like hurricanes. Why do hurricanes happen? Well, hurricanes happen to purify the air and to purify the Earth because the Earth is thrown off balance and it needs to get back on track. So it very much appears that the Earth has an immune system which is trying to protect itself and heal itself. So I believe what happened when, when Adam sinned, Adam was, why was Adam put in the garden? He was put in there to protect the garden from animals to, because the animals could have defiled the garden. He was there to protect the very sacred place. I believe the Garden of Eden is like, is like a, a central organ of the earth, like a vital organ. And if someone, if someone was to destroy the Garden of Eden, that could destroy the whole earth, in my theory. I can't prove it 100%, but that's my theory. So that's why the Garden of Eden needed to be protected. Adam was there to protect it. But when Adam partook of that fruit when he wasn't supposed to, he, he seriously wounded the um, integrity of the Garden of Eden, the, the, that central organ of the earth. He seriously threatened the entire earth's existence by taking part of that fruit. Because of that, it was no more safe for Adam to be in the garden anymore. He had to be kicked out because the earth could be destroyed if he stayed there. And, um, and uh, now it makes sense why all these horrible diseases happen because the earth now, the earth actually, the earth's immune system believes or the earth's immune system is identifying humans as a virus that needs to be eliminated. So the earth is like, okay, this is a virus. Humans are a virus and we need to kill the virus to protect the earth. So I believe that's literally what's happening is that the earth's immune system is trying to kill us because we are viewed as a virus that is deadly and will kill the earth if we're not stopped. And in many ways we are. Look at what we're doing to the planet. You know, we're doing so much horrible stuff. We're polluting it. Nuclear war, like imagine if we had an all out nuclear war, we would destroy the earth. So we are like a virus in many ways. So that, as I said, it's a theory. I can't prove it 100%, but it makes sense. And it would make sense why now all of a sudden it's logical for Elohim to say, okay, don't eat of that tree. Because if you eat of it, that could destroy the whole earth. And why is it there? Because that's the earth's immune system. It's the earth's uh, vital organ. It has to be there. It, it, just like we have a heart. Uh, it's like, why would, why would Elohim create the Garden of Eden if he knew that Adam was going to sin? Well, why would he make a human's heart if he knew they were going to sin? You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make sense to say that. If the Garden of Eden is like the heart of the earth, now it makes sense why he made the Garden of Eden, because he had to in order for the earth to be alive. That's like its central organ, and it needs to be protected at all costs. Anyways, again, theory. Can't prove it. Um, I don't know if you guys like that theory or not, but that's something I came up with on my own, and I like it. So, um, so then, uh, let's see. Is there anything else to say before we end this? Uh, well, Jubilees, you know how we talked about the, the seven-day theory? Each day is a thousand years. That's actually supported by Jubilees as well, because it says... According to Adam, uh, according to Julius, it says, Adam, he lacked 70 years of 1,000 years. For 1,000 years are as one day in the testimony of the heavens. And therefore was it written concerning the tree of knowledge, on the day that you eat thereof, ye shall die. For this reason, he did not complete the years of this day, for he died during it. So Jubilees explains to us how Adam did die in the day that he ate of it. Because the day that he ate of it was a 1,000 year period. Because in Hebrew, the word day doesn't necessarily mean a 24-hour period. It means a cycle. And the word for day is yom. And that word yom is identical, except one slight letter difference, to the word yam, which means sea. And what does a sea do? A sea has tides. It tides in and tides out. 
So think of that word tide for a second. There's an English word tide. And that word in English tide means time. It actually is used for the, the, the seas of tide, the, the tidal seas, but it's also used for time. Like if someone says the turn of the tide and glad tidings, glad tidings to you. Um, that word tide means literally time. And it's using, t and it also is used in English to mean a 24 hour day. So I believe that's not a coincidence and that the Hebrew word literally means like tide. So it's used, it's used for sea to mean, you know, a sea tides in and tides out. And it's used for a day, a 24 hour day, because the sun tides in and it tides out. Just like a sea tides in and tides out. So I think that's why it's called a, a yom or yam. And then for, I'm not sure why a thousand years is called a tide, but maybe it's because for some special period, it happens every thousand years where something tides in and tides out. That's would, would be my guess as to why a thousand years is considered a day. So, or considered a yom, that is. Um, then we're told about how Cain died. Cain died in Jubilee's, the house, a house fell on top of Cain and killed him. That contradicts the, the um, that contradicts the rabbinic theory. The rabbinic theory is that Lamech shot an arrow and killed Cain. That's directly contradictory to what Jubilee says. And I believe Jubilee is more ancient and authoritative than rabbinic tradition. So I, I place my bets with Jubilee's account of Cain's death rather than rather than uh, the rabbinic version. Now there is, there are some apocryphal texts that agree with the rabbinic version. My theory is that perhaps there's a mixture of truth. Perhaps the rabbinic version is based on, on partial reality. Uh, perhaps um, Lamech, maybe it was Lamech's house that fell on Cain, or maybe Lamech, uh, uh, this is the Lamech, the Lamech from Cain's line, by the way, not the Lamech from, not Noah's father Lamech, but Cain's descendant named Lamech. So I suspect that uh, Cain's descendant Lamech might have been involved in Cain's death somehow, but not in the way that rabbinic tradition says, but in a similar way, but somehow that involved uh, Cain's house falling down on top of him. And there is an account by one of the church fathers that actually combines the two stories. So that's interesting right there. Now, another thing that I find important is Jubilees actually tells us that the animals became sinful. And I am a strong believer that not just animals are sinners, but he, uh, excuse me, not just humans are sinners, but animals can be sinners as well. I'm strongly of that belief. You see, animals can be really horrible. They can be brutal in nature, but they can also be sweet and loving and kind. There's a lot of actions that animals do that appears to be very similar to humans in terms of brutality and horrible sin, but they also are very loving and compassionate, sometimes way more than humans are. So there's also, there's a lot of evidence in scripture that animals are sinful, but Jubilees makes a clear statement on that. I'll read the statement. It says, Lawlessness increased on the earth, and all flesh corrupted its way, alike men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walks on the earth. All of them corrupted their ways and their orders, and they began to devour each other, and lawlessness increased on the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of all men was thus evil continually. So for, it says that lawlessness increased on the earth, all flesh corrupted its way, including animals, and all of them, the animals, they cover the ways and the orders, and they begin to devour each other. And because of the animals and humans doing all that stuff, lawlessness increased on the earth. Then it says every imagination of the thoughts of all men was evil continually. So it does imply that the men were more evil than the animals, but uh, overall the animals were sinful as well. And because of this, it says, and God looked upon the earth and behold, he was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his orders, and all that were upon the earth had wrought all manner of evil before his eyes. And he said that he would destroy man and all flesh upon the face of the earth, which he had created. So that gives us more of the story. It wasn't just because humans were sinful and that the Nephilim were sinful. The whole earth had become corrupt. 
because of how sinful and evil they were. Kind of like we are in the last days here. There's a lot of horrible, evil people here. You, we wonder how long Elohim is going to let this go on because of how horribly evil the world is becoming. But it's going to keep going on for a while until it becomes so bad that Elohim will have enough. And he'll send fire to kill most of the people. But he'll save a remnant for the Millennial Kingdom. So that's anyway, for me, that's very significant because Jubilees is, is further testimony that animals are just like us and that we need to respect them and believe that they have a spiritual nature. They're not just uh, they're not just soulless, spiritless beings, but they actually have a nature very similar to humans that should be treated as such. Now, I'm not of the view that as many people in our day are that that we need to be vegetarian, but I'm of the position that we are to respect animals. So, you know, there are some animals that eat other animals. Like, uh, you know, lions and such. They eat other animals, and a lot of them have to because they're carnivores. We don't have to because we're omnivores, but we our bodies are designed to be able to, to do both, I believe. Um, but despite that, let's just say, hypothetically here, for those who don't agree with this, let's say, let's say Elohim did give us permission to eat animals. Does that mean, now that we have permission to eat animals, that, does that mean, okay, now we can abuse them however we like? No, it does not mean that. But that's what we see a lot of people do, and that's a shame. So whether you eat animals or you don't, or you agree with it or not, we have to agree that we, as a human race, have been horribly abusive to animals, and that is a tragedy and, tragedy and injustice. And I believe we will be judged how we treat animals. You know, if we abuse animals as so many do, they're like us. They are not very different from us. So how we treat animals is gonna come back to bite us one day if we don't repent and turn from our wickedness. So every, a lot of people are gonna have a lot to answer for based on how they treated and abused animals. And the entire meat industry is very abusive to, towards animals. So we definitely wanna oppose how people are treating animals as a whole. Uh, so we have things we should agree on as common ground. I think that's a very good common ground to have. We should all agree that animals should not be abused just because you're having a bad day. Yeah, people do that. They abuse them. And they shouldn't be, they, all creatures have rights and we should give them the rights. You know, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't put them in like, horrible cages and horrible living conditions for you know so just things like that that we should all agree on but unfortunately sadly we don't but scripture helps us see that scripture helps us see that we need to be compassionate and loving towards animals not just humans because they're very much like us uh, so it tells us that if our enemies animals are lost we should care for those lost animals and we should return them to their owners even though we are enemies to their owners we should return them because we don't want the animals to be to die because they are away from their owner. So there's a there's a compassion there, and in most cases, the, the scripture says that when you fight a nation, when Israel fight, fights a nation, they're not to kill the animals. Most of the time, they're not to kill the animals; they are to spare them because they're innocent. And in the book of Jonah, the animals fast. It has the animals fasting. And the same thing in the book of Judith. The animals actually fast. They participate in the repentance. So that's something interesting to consider. Let's see. Anything else to say before we end this? Just one final thing. Uh, um... According to Jubilees and Enoch, all the Nephilim and giants were destroyed in the flood. Not one was left. There are some people who believe that Nephilim were not all destroyed in the flood, but that is not the case. They all died out in the flood. The de then they were demons. After, the, after they were all killed, then they remained on the earth as demons. And demons begin to possess people and corrupt their DNA through possession, through demon possession. Like, are you guys familiar with... Um, one of the big giants of recent time, there was a giant in the 20th century who grew to eight feet 11 
inches. The way he grew to that length was because of something in his pituitary gland. I believe the demons probably possessed him and messed with his pituitary gland. And I believe that's how, I believe that's how the Nephilim came back after the flood. Instead of the angels coming and having sex again, instead the demons possessed people and the demons, while being possessing people, they messed with their brain and caused hormonal imbalance and caused them to, you know, to grow as giants again. Hmm. Let's All see, right. was there a question? Uh, yeah, they, they fast when they're injured. That's a good point. And I've also seen animals, when you, when an animal has lost, like let's say an owner dies or one of its really close friends, like, you know, some animals have a friend. Uh, I've heard of examples where they're, they're, the animal will have a, uh, a loss of a friend or owner and they'll stop eating out of sadness. They will, they're like mourning and they, they don't eat it because they are just so sad. Some animals, they stop eating and eventually they die because they, they refuse to eat because of sadness. So that's something definitely, um, and okay, there are a couple final things to mention. Um, Jubilee has a very powerful statement of uh, of the ability of righteousness. I'm of the belief that humans do not have a sin nature. There's, there are people who believe that, but I think that's a very heretical doctrine and a very corrupting doctrine, and I don't think it's biblical or scriptural. Jubilee has this to say on that subject. It says, he made for all his work, this is after the flood happened, okay? After the flood happened, it says, he made for all his works a new and righteous nature so that they should not sin in their whole nature forever, but should be all righteous, each in his kind, always. So that tells us that after the flood happened, he purified all creatures so that they had the ability to be completely sinless in their entire natures and be righteous always. So that shows us that there is not a sin nature we were created with a new and righteous nature. We don't have a sin nature. We have a righteous nature, a pure, innocent nature. If we become sinful, it's because we choose to. That's what the whole scripture teaching reveals to us. So Jubilee is a powerful evidence in that favor. And it tells us that no matter what, whatever people do, it will be judged. It will be judged by Elohim. If uh, it says if they if you repent you will be forgiven, but if you don't repent, according to Jubilees, uh, he will not accept no matter what. He will not. It says, let me let me read it. It says, the judgment of all is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets in righteousness. Even all who depart from the path which is ordained for them to walk in, and if they walk not therein, judgment is written down for every creature and for every kind. Again emphasizing that animals can sin. It says, judgment is written down for every creature in every kind. Well, we know in Genesis, there's different kinds of animals. So it says, and there is nothing in heaven or on earth or in light or in darkness or in shoal or in the depth or in the place of darkness, which is not judged. And all their judgments are ordained and written and engraved. In regard to all, he will judge the great according to his greatness and the small according to his smallness and each according to his way. And he is not one who will regard the person, or he will respect the person, nor is he one who will receive gifts. If he says that he will execute them on each, if one gave everything that is on the earth, he will not regard the gifts or the person of any, nor accept anything at his hands, for he is the righteous judge. So why does he say that? Because uh, some people have the belief that, oh, you know, if I'm a good, if I have faith, you know, I could still be a sinner, but if I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I'll be saved. Well, according to this account, Jubilee says, no, he's not going to regard any person. Just because you're a Christian does not mean he's going to overlook your sins. He's going to judge you probably even stricter if you're a Christian. If you're a believer of the Bible, he's going to judge you even more harshly because you should know better. And Revelation says we will be judged according to our works. So uh, he's going to execute judgment on everyone according to how great or small they are. 
and he's not going to he's not going to regard the gifts of any person. So, um, you know, they say faith not of works; it is the gift of God. Um, but he's not going to. It says he's not going to regard the gifts. He's not going to regard gifts. He needs to see works. So. According to James, it's faith and works. And I believe Paul, if interpreted properly, you will see that Paul says the same thing, except he's using different words. But if you don't agree with Paul, at least agree with James, because it's clear, according to James, that and the rest of testimony of Scripture, that it is faith and works, and that he's not going to forgive someone just because they have faith if they're being in sin, if they're living in sin and not repenting. Uh, that's the overall testimony here. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I was asked, uh, th yeah, this is in Jubilees that I was just reading, chapter five, okay? All right. Are there any more questions for Onya? Yeah, you guys have any questions? Any further questions? I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I don't know if we'll continue Jubilees next week. If Jackson wants me to, I can. Uh, as Mike said, we hope sometime this year maybe even in a couple of weeks or next week i don't know when jackson wants to do it but uh i would definitely like to go through nazarene acts with you guys and make a superior version that incorporates the differences between homilies and the recognitions um as i mentioned before if you do want to support uh you could either support me or you could support jackson Snyder, the yihad you know the yihad accepts donations and uh i also have a setup where i have a patreon actually you guys might be interested uh for the yihad you might be interested in setting up a patreon account where people they do take a percentage of of uh, how much people donate but it is it could be a good way to get more people to donate if they do it through patreon it can because it's simpler um in some ways so with all that said, mine mine is Dead Sea Scrolls Religion from Patreon. I would recommend making one for the Yihad. I think that'd be a great idea. All right. Cool. Shalom, guys. Have a good rest of your Sunday and a good uh, rest of your week. We'll, we'll hopefully we'll see you next week. All right. Shalom, everybody. This uh, here ends the third installment, I believe, of Onyu's teaching. Now, tonight at 8, we have a... Um, membership a new membership and gathering so uh that's at eight eastern time same room number and all that can attend should definitely attend um and look forward to seeing as many of you as possible there so at eight o'clock same room i'm not going to probably be there but just for other people uh, is jackson going to be there or he's not going to make that either uh, he said he would try to make it actually okay great Thanks, guys. Yeah, See thanks, you later. Tonya. All right, guys, this is uh, the end, and I pray that it was enjoyable, that you learned a lot. And uh, until next time, shalom.